What's up guys, Rick here with another edition of these off-season general strategy videos. And this week we are talking lineup building. How to build lineups, or maybe different ways to build lineups. The pros and cons of each. It's a very simple concept that when you're talking about golf lineups becomes incredibly complex incredibly quickly. So I'm going to take you through uh, some general ideas, different ways to start constructing your hopefully winning lineups and hoping to hear from you. So let me know what you think. Tweet me at Rick Rungood, leave a, leave a comment below, but otherwise let's, let's just jump into this, see what happens. Let's go. The first way to make lineups is by hand. Yeah. B bear with me here. This, this will get more complex, but listen, I actually recommend building your first lineup every single week by hand. And when by hand, uh, when I say that, I mean no optimizers, no models, nothing. Just go get a feel for the pricing, start plugging golfers in and seeing what types of lineups that you can make. You're gonna find a couple of things. You're going to find uh, who the value plays are, uh, if there is a natural build. So for example, a lot of times you'll see a very popular golfer in the $7,000 range, maybe low $7,000 range, and you'll click that name. And then you'll go up and you'll see another very popular golfer in that you know mid $8,000 range, and you'll click that name. And now you're starting to see what the natural build is for the week. Because listen, the vast majority of people are still building lineups by hand. Maybe not the majority of lineups are being built by hand, I don't have the data on that, but I imagine that the majority of people are still building lineups by hand, especially casual and especially in single entry uh, contests. So knowing what those natural uh, landing spots are, the natural builds are going to help you kind of predict or understand what ownership is going to be. If you keep landing on the same three golfers, uh, you know, to fill out your lineups, everyone else probably will too if you're building by hand. There's also a concept that I go back to, and this will actually come into play uh, in a bit when we talk about core cascading, which is a nice little ditty we can talk about. But um, to me, I still very much subscribe to the first lineup that you build each week is probably your best. There are obviously exceptions to that rule. However, I work really, really hard on my first lineup. Um, is my second lineup the best or my third lineup the best? Probably not, because if I thought it was better, it would have been my first lineup, right? So I spent a lot of time building the first one and then just naturally and in theory, every lineup you build after that will be subsequently worse because if you thought it was better, it would have been your first lineup. So that's kind of the thought process here. Now, obviously the results change that, uh, but that's, that's kind of the thought process that I go through. So I work really, really hard on hand building my first lineup that's going to come into play uh, later for core cascading. And the other thing is, especially in golf, where not a lot of information changes over the course of a week, right? If you're playing another sport, uh, building your first lineup on a Monday in NFL, uh, that's, that's certainly not going to be your best lineup that you build, right? Because there's going to be more information that comes out Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, as we get closer to the week. Uh, but with golf, there's so much static information that I really don't think there's a huge difference outside of projected ownership coming back to building on a Monday versus building on a Wednesday. So I always start my week building a lineup by hand, learning what I can do who I can fit in the lineups, who the natural landing spots are, which then in turn tells you what the natural pivot spots are, and just getting a feel for the pricing. That is part one. Part two revolves around optimizers or custom models. This is a real you know, key term in the industry. Everybody thinks an optimizer or a model is going to solve all of their problems, and maybe it does, but maybe it doesn't. And an optimizer or a model is only as good as your inputs. And there is a million different types of models uh, that you can that you can use or optimizers that you can use. I'm obviously partial to the one on my website, rickrungood.com, which I will show you right now. So here's the custom model. Now, what I think is noteworthy, you might be using a model that is, or an optimizer um, that is for all sports or generally set up in the same way for all sports, which I think is a flaw. Obviously my custom model, because I only cover golf, because I only care about golf, um, is very golf oriented, which I think is critically important here. But again, this is really only as good as the inputs that, that, that you enter. So I allow you to choose the types of stats, 
that you want to see, uh, birdie or better percentage, all the strokes gain metrics, uh, so on and so forth for however much time you want or however many recent rounds you want, um, you can weigh those. Now, <clears throat> that's going to give you uh, a value that you can optimize on. And of course, the pros to an optimizer or a custom model is that you are able to build a lot of lineups quickly. Um, but additionally, I like the fact that you can kind of build lineups that maybe your brain wouldn't have necessarily considered. So let me give you a couple of examples. You know, the lineup that I build by hand uh, might be because for this week, I like golfers that are accurate off the tee or they're long drivers or they're great scramblers. Well, when I start putting my model weights in, I'm probably also going to, to have a bias towards those types of golfers, right? It's who I think is going to play well. An optimizer can kind of allow you to get out of that bias a little bit, whether it's with a randomizer or whether it is changing how many common golfers are showing up in each one of your lineups. Uh, the ability to say, you know, um, you know, the, the first lineup that would be optimized would be six golfers and you can swap out one of those golfers or you can have to swap out two or three or four or even five will allow you to expand or shrink your player pool depending on what you're looking for. Uh, one of the biggest questions, arguably the question I get asked the most is, Rick, I'm building 20 lineups, I'm building 150 lineups, uh, how many golfers should I have in my player pool? To me, that is not a question I can answer. That is a personal preference. It is a risk tolerance uh, qu a question that you need to answer. I, t I like to keep my core very tight, meaning few golfers, so that if those few golfers do well, I'm going to have a lot of lineups that have a chance to win. That's what I like. That is high risk and high reward. I understand I'm gonna have a lot of losing weeks and I'm gonna have some good lottery tickets when that does indeed hit when that core hits. Uh, you could also spread out your golfers, have more golfers in your player pool, have less common golfers uh, in each one of those lineups, and you can get a larger percentage of the player pool. Now, you're going to have access to more golfers, but you're not going to have necessarily a core that you are really uh, happy with if they play well. You're going to have to try to find that exact combination, but at least you have more chances to find that combination. Now, optimizers are also gonna let you do a couple of other things that doing it by hand is not gonna let you do. Again, it's mostly in bulk. We can run 150 lineups here and I can change uh, you know, what my max projected ownership is for that lineup. So if I wanna be a bit more contrarian, I could lower that number or I could raise that number if I was looking for someone or a, a team with a, with a higher floor. But it really allows you to, to hone in on your, uh, on your metrics, on your goals on your core, on the things that are most important to you, depending on your contest. And then of course I can easily see what types of uh, percentage uh, exposure I have to certain golfers. And if I want to ramp that up or not, uh, I, it's very easy in optimizers or models to lock golfers in or exclude golfers and start creating different types of scenarios that might be beneficial to you. We'll talk about that in just one second, even more, but this is uh, just a small taste into obviously the pros and cons of optimizers. This would be my step two. Um, I would start generally building, you know, running a hundred lineups, running 150 lineups with different parameters to see what type of value golfers pop up. What golfers are constantly in these, these, uh, in these results, in these builds. And, and for that reason, you know, I'll learn what the computer, what the model thinks is valuable based on salary and based on the, the input that we put in there. So it, it is something that I'll, I'll start to see the trends for. I'm not going to bend the knee. I'm not going to live and die by just the model, just my hand build. I'm trying to build a cohesive lineup building experience over the course of a couple of days and over the course of a couple of different spokes of the wheel. Um, I do want to show you something called core cascading. This is a, I guess I invented this. I don't know if that's actually true or not, but I get a lot of credit for kind of being the creator of this, or maybe the first one to put it on camera a couple of years ago, um, where essentially I build one core lineup and then I swap golfers out from there. So let me let me show you what this looks like. And then uh, a couple of years ago, someone else coined the term core cascading. I did not have a name for it. Uh, that is what it's been dubbed over the years. And for whatever reason, I get a lot of credit for this. Uh, but I, I still deploy it to this day and I want to show you what it looks like. Okay. So here's what we got. 
uh, I would uh, each week, and I do each week, go in and I would download the salaries from DraftKings. And I would uh, enter uh, essentially a dummy lineup, right? That dummy lineup can be your original build. It can be, uh, I generally do like the six least expense, least expensive guys. Don't forget to uh, swap that out. I've made that mistake once or twice. Uh, and you're stuck with six terrible golfers. Uh, but what I would do is I would create a dummy lineup and that I would enter that into uh, whatever contest that I want, however often that I want. I have found that the core cascading works best with 20 max contests, 20 max. I've done it with 150 max. I know a lot of people who do it for that. Fine and dandy. I just think it is much more tangibly benefit beneficial in a 20 max. So what I would do is I would create a dummy lineup. In this case, my dummy lineup is uh, Sam Burns, Aaron Wise, Lonto Griffin, Brian Stewart, Alex Smalley, Sam Ryder. This is from the Sanderson Farm. So this was a couple of months ago. And uh, this lineup, I believe the total salary in it was about 46,700. You can do whatever you want with that. Um, but let's uh, let me build a lineup that's closer to 50,000 because I think that is that is what most people are going to do. So I can leave uh, Burns and Wise. Let me upgrade um, Lonto to maybe like Carlos Ortiz. And again, I'm just going to do all of this in Excel. Uh, let me try Taylor Pendrith instead of Brian Stewart. We'll see, uh, we'll see how much of this costs real quick. Yeah, okay, this is 48,800. So I've got $1,200 to work with here. So I'm going to essentially uh, load this in to my file. And remember, when you download your lineups from DraftKings, and I will link to you uh, a video that I created probably over a year ago, the best way to mass import lineups. Uh, when you export your lineups, you'll get them in this format. So you can quick, quickly and easily just update these, change them, and save them and re-upload them. And you've, and you've accomplished your entire lineup building process in like 30 seconds. So th these would be my 20 lineups here. And all of them have the same core. The, uh, the core principle of the core cascading process is to have a lot of exposure to these six guys. And then what we're going to do is in each lineup, we are gonna swap out one of these guys for someone else. So essentially, if these six golfers all make the cut or all play well, you are in River City, right? You're going to have a ton of really good lineups and lineups that can make you money. Um, if not, if one of these guys misses the cut, well, that's okay because you will have a couple of lineups that you have swapped each one of these golfers out. This is an incredibly high risk, high reward strategy. Let me show you what this looks like. And I will also declare, before I do that, I'll also declare there's no rules to this. You know, people say, hey, Rick, how much money should I leave on the table? Are you trying to get uh, golfers that are, you know, two golfers in the 9K range? Do you want to do stars and scrubs? It doesn't matter. Um, you're just trying to build one lineup that you love, one lineup that you want to be your core, and then swap out and sprinkle out the others. It removes some of your biases. When you make the swaps, you're looking for golfers that you might not have had exposure to otherwise, golfers that you might like in the same range. It's It's... It's a fascinating exercise. Um, there was one other thing I wanted to mention here, but I don't exactly remember what it was. So I'll just continue. So here's what I would do. So this would be lineup number one. This is my core lineup. And let me, maybe I can zoom in a little bit here. Um, that is my core lineup. Let me make this a little bit easier to read. Okay, so I would leave my top line up here. That's my core. And now I'm going to swap out Sam Ryder three times. So I'm going to delete Sam Ryder three times. Then I'm going to come over to Alex Smalley and I'm going to delete him three times. I'm going to delete Taylor Pendrith three times. I'm going to delete Carlos Ortiz three times. And notice how I'm working down. This is the cascade portion, right? I'm working down the list here so that uh, when I'm done with this, getting rid of Aaron Wise three times, and then you're going to have to get rid of one guy four times. I don't care if this is the hot, most expensive guy, least expensive guy, guy that you like the most, guy that you like the least. It doesn't matter. Be to get to 20 lineups, you're going to have to swap one of these guys out four times, and the other, you're going to have to swap out three. So you can see by the gaps in this, and maybe it'll be easier if I put a box around it, because if I put a box around this, you're really going to see the missing the missing spots here. So I've got, you know, uh, the same lineup 
without Sam Ryder three times, and then I'm gonna put someone else in that spot. Same with every single golfer. So this this can go very, very quickly. So Sam Ryder, who I know cost um, uh, 60, I guess I should have checked this, 6,800, I believe, 6,700. And I know that I have a $1,200 cushion. Uh, so I could go up to $7,900 to find golfers that would still fit in this core cascading method. I do like to leave a, generally, listen, again, I'm trying to make my best lineup. If it costs $50,000, that's fine. I'll swap down every single time. But if I, uh, if I had a choice, I'd probably like to leave a couple hundred bucks on the table so that I can swap up. So especially if you're not playing the most expensive golfer on the slate, if you leave yourself a couple hundred bucks, you can generally swap up to get that golfer. So right now I know that I can go $7,900 or less on, on anybody in Sam Ryder's spot. So maybe I was like, oh, you know what? I liked Keith Mitchell, but I, I didn't get access to him. And then I would probably say something like, you know what? I'm not a fan of Mackenzie Hughes this week, but I'm gonna go with Mackenzie Hughes. Because again, remember the idea of this is to also get sprinkle exposure to guys that you normally wouldn't have, right? Remove your biases, take guys that you wouldn't have picked here, right? And then I can go get, uh, let's call it Joel Damon as my last guy. And now I'll do the same for Alex Smalley's spot. Well, Alex Smalley's even cheaper. He's 6,400. Now let's say, let's say I don't have any money left over and I want to just swap out the next three guys. I could just, and I've done this before very successfully. I've, some of these, some of these margins are so incredibly small. I'll just grab the next three guys on the list or something like that and take Wyndham Clark, Jimmy Walker, and Davis Riley, and I'll plug those guys in. And it's just like, I, I'm just trying to throw chaos into the mix. If Davis Riley has a good week or Jimmy Walker has a good week and I've got him at a half a percent owned in a core that is really strong, that's how I get a, a differentiated. This is how I won the birdie for the Masters a couple of years ago uh, because I, I made the, the one lineup that I had the right swap for the winner and the rest of the core was hot fire. That's how you win. That is how you win. And I would not have probably built that lineup by hand uh, or kind of in my, in my head. So you continue to go here. Uh, Pendrith is 7,800, but I know I can go up to 9,000. Now I gotta make sure to not get guys I already have, right? Like I could put Keith Mitchell, so I could do this. I could put Keith Mitchell here. So now I have Keith Mitchell swapped into two different spots. I would like this if I was a big fan of Keith Mitchell, but he just missed out on my core, maybe like my seventh or eighth golfer, and I have some money left over. Because what you don't want to happen is if Keith Mitchell plays really well, but Taylor Pendrith is the one that misses the cut, well, that lineup that I swapped Keith Mitchell into still doesn't win. But if I have if, if I have Keith Mitchell in a couple of spots, he does really well, and just one of those other guys fails, I've got him in two swaps. So I can kind of work it like that. And maybe I want to fill this out with Matias Schwab. And I got to be careful here. Don't go get Carlos Ortiz because I already have him. That'll break DraftKings when you try to load that in. And I can just go from there. And, you know, uh, again, I'll just, for, for, for speed purposes, I'll just grab three names. But when you see this finished, um, you'll see how this is going to end up shaping out here. Let me just quickly round these out. And then Sam Burns, uh, I can get any four golfers that I want because they're all less expensive than him. So now you look at this and I'll put the box around it again to try to make this um, really stand out. You have uh, six guys in basically 16 out of 20 of your lineups. And then you have sprinkled in little tiny swaps to all of these other flyers to try to differentiate. Now, this is still a high risk, high reward strategy, but it is one that um, when you get all six through the cut, or God forbid, you get all six through the cut and one of the guys, one of the guys in the core wins, uh, you are in business. It's, it's something that I encourage you to do. Start with it in um, 20 max entries. And then I've seen, I've seen people do different cores for 150. Maybe not every single golfer in 150, but maybe I'll do three or four or five cores and I'll swap out guys five, six, seven times, right? You can continue to extrapolate this out. It's a very interesting thought process. Again, goals, the only goals are make your best core and um, try to remove your biases. Swap, swap to guys you maybe would not have normally. That's, that is the whole point. It is one that um, I find is is very successful. So I wish you I wish you luck with that. Uh, let's continue on our lineup building uh, journey here. To me, the most difficult part of building lineups uh, for golf is the lack of correlation. 
So if you play any other fantasy sports, and I'm sure that you do, you will realize that um, it's a lot easier to be correlated in other sports. You take a quarterback and a wide receiver from the same team. If a quarterback throws a touchdown to that wide receiver, you're getting double points, right? Very, very simple. Very, very um, common practice to stack teams from or players from the same team. Basketball, same thing. You can also uh, you know get multiple guys from the same team or uh, in, in those sports, you could also look at the, uh, you know, the Vegas lines, the, the odds, the totals. That is highly correlated to the outcome of games and to the outcome of fantasy scores. It's very, very highly correlated. What, where does that exist in golf? It doesn't, really, is the answer. Because there's really nothing from Sam Burns. If Sam Burns plays well, that has little to no impact on Will Zalatoris. Uh, and I would argue... In most cases, none, right? So it's it's almost like you're having to find six individual uncorrelated golfers. Now, there are a few things. There are a few things that you could look into um, that might help. And, and stacking, it's a lot harder in golf, but I think it is interesting. You could stack groups. I've seen this, and the data is very, very noisy, but there is a, a, a subsection of people out there that believe you know, if you have a group of two or a group of three golfers and one of them gets hot, they can kind of feed off of each other. We've heard golfers argue about this and and, and mention this, but it, the data is a little bit noisier than what the golfers actually think is happening. And we only remember the times where, you know, two guys or three guys from the same group all go low. So I'm not a huge fan of that. The most common would be... Um, tea time stacking, right? Around specific weather. If you think there is going to be a weather advantage in the morning versus the afternoon, maybe it's going to get windier in the afternoon. Uh, stacking five or even six golfers from the morning wave might be um, even more beneficial. There was actually a really cool, fun little tweet from Lou Stagner uh, that he just sent out. Let me pull this up for you so you can see where basically uh, he went through all of the data from 2004 to 2021, essentially all the shot link data, and looked at different lengths of putts uh, according to the time of day and the, uh, p- the make rate for those times. And this is the one thing that we really don't talk about, um, where foot traffic early in the day, the less foot traffic, the easier it is, to, or, or the more putts these guys are making, believe it or not. Um, you know, that foot traffic around the hole all day long makes things bumpier. Guys are missing more putts. Let me give you a, a, an example here. So uh, from eight to eight and a half feet, that is, according to Lou's tweet here, uh, that is uh, from 8 a.m. and earlier, you make that about 50 and a half percent of the time, 50.6, which is about right on with the, um, you know, the tour average, right? I, I, well, obviously he's showing us that, but like if you, across all times, that's, that's, that's pretty darn good. Maybe a little bit higher, but as the day goes on, you know, when you start getting to one to two o'clock, it's down to 48%. When you start going to four o'clock or later, it's down to 47%. Now that is obviously very, very, very small margins, but routinely we kind of see uh, AM tea times be a little bit better. Now, the problem with that is your guys are going to get the opposite the next day, right? Um, now, if you know the tea times, it is possible to kind of get guys that are in the middle of both. Maybe you want to straddle the line. Maybe you want to get guys that don't go out super early. They go out like, um, you know, an hour or two into the morning wave and then an hour or two into the PM wave and try to fight against this. But this is the type of thing that you're really kind of grasping at straws with when you're trying to stack. Uh, additionally, uh, skill set skill set stacking doesn't get talked about enough. You know, really, if if you have a course that has a, a very strong correlated stat to it, maybe ball strikers have been phenomenal at this event. Maybe um, uh, long drivers have have thrived at this event. Go get yourself some long drivers, right? And they don't always have to be good. Uh, I don't want to throw guys under the bus, but like you know, there are going to be long drivers that are much cheaper right? That are, are further down the board, still bomb it. Maybe they're your value plays of the week. Do you think it is um, a coincidence that basically all of the events that Matthew Wolf has contended in, Bryson DeChambeau has contended in, those kind of guys are, are very similar. I mean, they're both very unique, but closer to each other than most. I mean, these are the types of things that you could really uh, hang your hat on if you were trying to get correlated and if you were trying to 
um, find some edges, and, and, and quite honestly, play the extremes. I think these are kind of extreme things to do, but if you're trying to win all the money, if you're trying to take on that great risk, or you know, get that great reward, that great risk might be something that you wanna take on. And finally, I'll leave you with um, something that I talk about all the time, and I literally tweet out on a near weekly basis, Leaving money on the table, aka not spending um, the full $50,000 on DraftKings is the quickest way to be unique. The idea of having unique lineups, uh, and in the smaller the field, the more important this becomes, is important. If you hit a, you know, having a unique lineup is is completely different than having a, um, a contrarian lineup, right? You could have a lineup where every single golfer in it is 20% owned and you are the only one who has it uh, because maybe you've left a thousand or 1500 or $2,000 on the table. Um, if you guys follow me on Twitter, which you should at Rick run good, you'll know that every single week and here it is. I tweet out the optimal lineup, go into Twitter and type in Rick run good optimal into the search. Uh, and what you will find is that there is a huge difference between the optimal lineup and the winning lineup. The optimal lineup is the best possible lineup you could have made. Almost every single week, no one makes the optimal lineup. Whoever wins all the money on DraftKings, it's you, it is almost certainly not the optimal lineup. Um, the exceptions are generally majors. Majors are uh, the softer pricing, guys can get the optimal a little bit easier, but still there are weeks where guys, the guy who won all the money on DraftKings uh, has not made one of the top 150 optimal lineups or 300 optimal lineups. So a uh, big difference between the optimal and the winning lineup. And what you'll often see is that uh, the optimal lineup, the best possi- possible lineup you could have made has left many hundreds of dollars, if not thousands on the table. Um, I'm just gonna scroll through a couple of these and I believe they are most recent here. Uh, most recent first, 49,000 was the optimal lineup. 49.8, that one's actually pretty close. 49.7, um, let's see, 40, well, maybe I gotta do it by latest here. 49.5, 49.6, 48.6, 49,0 just kind of scrolling through. It's 45,100 at the Shriners. How about that? 45,100. There was probably not a lineup that was built that was 45,100, uh, but that would have won you all the money if, if you found that lineup. Uh, 49,8, 49,5, 47,8. Again, 47,000. It is, it is kind of rare. I think it happens like once or twice a year where 50,000 is, is, is the actual optimal lineup. So um, again, what are our natural biases? Our natural biases are recent form, what other people are saying, um, spending all of our money. How often do you have one spot left and it says you have $7,800 left and you go straight to 7,800 and you find a guy right there? I'm sure you do it every single week. What if you went to 7,300? What if you went to 6,800? Um, you'd differentiate yourself in a big way. And in an event or in a contest or a sport like golf that is so incredibly volatile, you are not going to leave much money on the table. There's a very, very small gap between golfers 100 and 150. So I highly encourage you to start leaving money on the table. I hope that was helpful. Just kind of a stream of consciousness uh, for, for some lineup building stuff. If you have any questions or would like me to deep dive into one of those particularly or a few of those, let me know. You can leave a comment below or you can tweet me at Rick Run Good. Best of luck, and I'll talk to you guys soon.